Good evening, everyone. I'm Tim Westermeyer, senior pastor here at St. Philip the Deacon, and it's our privilege and pleasure to welcome you to the concluding event in this year's Faith and Life Lecture Series, which is the end of the 21st season of the Faith and Life Series. Thank you. Um, I always like to open by asking, and I, I know what the answer to this one's going to be tonight, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Is there anyone here tonight for their first Faith and Life event? Good. Welcome. Excellent. And I want to be sure to welcome those of you joining us uh, digitally tonight as well. Welcome to each and every one of you. So for 21 years, we've welcomed business and nonprofit leaders, doctors, musicians, authors, bloggers. Um, we have welcomed a number of athletes, actually, to come and just reflect on how faith is connected to whatever it is that they do in life. Um, tonight, let me give you a sense of the flow of the night. I'm going to introduce our speaker in a bit. In a bit. I'm actually going to do a little curated conversation with him for the presentation portion of the evening. I'll ask him really hardball questions. Um, <laughs> after we're done with that, uh, there will be an opportunity for you all to ask questions through the mics to my right and my left if you're in the house. If you're online watching on our website, there should be a box where you could submit a question or you can send an email to social at spdlc.org, and those will be fed to me, and during that Q&A, we'll get to as many of those questions as we can. I think you all know who our, our, our guest tonight is, and you probably know a little bit about his bio. Um, as always with our speakers, I like to ask the question, um, you know, is there something that isn't in your official bio that people might not know about? His response to me just five minutes ago is that he had a, a broadcasting career, does anyone know about that? Short-lived. Um, and as part of that, I think I'm right about this, he had a show called The Huddle, uh, which was on a 50,000-watt radio station. And during his time there, it went from 50,000 watts down to 5,000 watts. <laughs> Will you join me in welcoming the Minnesota head coach, Kevin O'Connell? I do want to say, in all seriousness, I know this is a busy time for you. <laughs> I have a feeling part of you has been thinking the last few weeks, what did I agree to exactly? No. And why, do I, why, do I, why did I agree to it here? Um, I, I genuinely pray, though, that in the midst of a busy season for you, a busy moment for you, this can actually be a time for you to sort of pause and reflect and think about maybe some thing, yes, football for sure, but maybe some deeper questions as well. So Absolutely. That, sound good? that sounds phenomenal. And thank you guys all so much for coming. When you sign up to uh, potentially uh, get to come to a great event like this, you just hope to see some people in the seats. It's like, <laughs> I'm glad you guys didn't consider this like a preseason football game. You actually, you, uh, it's great to see you all and, and so, uh, so fortunate and blessed to, to be here tonight. So thank you. Well, again, thank you for saying yes. So. Um, Opening question, the question on everyone's mind, I know this, <laughs> is who's your first draft pick? <laughs> well, I can just tell you I'm still praying about it and not, uh, <laughs> not quite ready to reveal that yet, okay, but uh, well, I can tell you I'm very excited about the possibilities. Okay, How about that? Fair enough. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so the first serious question, well, I guess that's a serious question too, is for those who don't know your history, you want to talk a little about your upbringing and maybe particularly your upbringing as it related to faith. Yeah. So I was, uh, I was born in Knoxville, Tennessee. My dad worked for uh, you know, a certain three-letter company in the federal go government that required us to uh, move around a lot. You know, he, uh, we moved around a lot. I was born in Tennessee. We spent some time in Arizona, then moved to the New York, New Jersey area and then ultimately finished up moving to San Diego, California, which um, I don't know if you guys have been there, but when you compare San Diego, California, uh, no offense to any New Jersey folks here tonight, but I remember the moment they said we were moving to San Diego and I, I started crying, kicking and screaming, I'm not leaving this beautiful place. <laughs> then, uh, 
then I got off the airplane and I said I kind of understood what we were, what we were really doing. But uh, no, grew up in San Diego, got a chance to then attend San Diego State to uh, play football. We got an Aztec in the house, that's good. Um, and that's where I met my beautiful wife, Leah. She was a volleyball player there. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be a four-time team captain, which uh, when you win about 40% of your games as a quarterback, you really hang tight to that captaincy. <laughs> Um, and then ultimately I was drafted by the New England Patriots in the third round and get to go play for the greatest coach in NFL history, maybe in the history of our game, uh, behind probably, and without, not probably, behind the best quarterback uh, to ever play the game. And uh, what an environment it was to learn, um, grow. Uh, so many of the things that I, I really hold near and dear to my football journey started right then and there. But I did feel in a lot of ways like I was thrown into the deep end of the pool, uh, not knowing really what to really do every day, where to sit, who to talk to. And I was, you know, Leah was still at school, and I, you know, there were some moments where um, I remember, uh, you know, really thinking to myself, am I really cut out for this? Am I really uh, cut out for this, uh, this type of challenge? And what did I do in those moments? I did what I had been taught to do my, my, by my great parents, Bill and Suzanne. I prayed about it. I would wake up and, uh, you know, I'd, I think there's no way I could possibly, you know, attack this journey myself. So um, I prayed to, you know, I, I said, you know, God, please just be with me today, just for today. And then we'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. And before you know it, I was able to be there for a couple years. Didn't it exactly work out, you know, that number 12, he was harder to beat in that quarterback competition <laughs> than I thought. <laughs> Um, but I got a chance to meet a lot of great people, some great teammates, and then eventually moved on to the New York Jets for three years, finished up back in San Diego with the Chargers, um, and then ultimately, you know, decided this broadcasting thing was going to be the ticket. So what he didn't explain was 50,000 watts at the time reached, the radio station was about 30 miles from my house. So when I, I told everybody in town that... Uh, you know, 7 o'clock tonight, I'm going to be, you know, first show ever. I'm going to need some of you guys to call in. You know, I'm going to open the phone lines. Um, but what they didn't tell me was right at 7 o'clock, it cut down to 5,000 watts. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody was in Carlsbad uh, at the time trying to listen to the show, uh, the station was actually, they lost 45,000 watts to a Hispanic oh. uh, music channel. Oh. Um, <laughs> So they didn't hear me, at least, uh, you know, the, not the voice they thought they would hear. Um, and, I, and I had to eventually kind of hire some friends to drive down about five miles from the stadium to be able to call in. You know, I'm still very thankful for Robbie and Encinitas that I, you know, happened to be my best friend who would drive down and, and call in with some real uh, edgy questions for me. But, um, but no, I, I think... You know, when I think about my, my journey through football, uh, whether it was relationships, teammates, meeting my, my beautiful wife and having a family, like, my faith has been, I don't get to talk about it enough. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's something that uh, when, you, when you step at a podium as a head football coach in the National Football League, uh, I would love to talk about it more. I would love to. I think it's part of kind of my own personal mission as I continue to hopefully get a chance to be fortunate to be the head coach of the Minnesota Vikings is to hopefully start being able to share a little bit more about my faith and, and about my love of Christ because it's really defined everything about how I deal with adversity, which shows up for all of us every single day, uh, how I handle failure, which uh, I've dealt with a ton uh, in my life. I, I talk to a lot of our players a lot of the times about a term I like to call failing forward, which I think uh, anybody who's ever lived through failure and come out better on the, the other side, I'd be willing to bet we could have a cup of coffee and talk about how, how Jesus Christ played a role in that. Um, and ultimately, that, that's really defined so many things, whether directly or indirectly, uh, about who I am as a man, who I want to be as a father. It's my son Caden over here, our oldest of four, um, who got a chance to, to sneak out of the house tonight and join us tonight. But I want him to be here with all of us tonight because quite frankly, I, it gives me an opportunity. I may be sharing, you know, you know my story and, and my testimony in a lot of ways with you folks, but you know, it gives me an opportunity to share it with him as well. And I think you know, we, one of the things that is so important for my journey throughout the whole way is 
It was instilled in me at a young age, but there were foundational moments throughout my life, uh, you know, where it was not ever just me, and critical moments, sometimes ending in failure, sometimes ending in failure that I thought was truly the end, uh, you know, of even my connection with the game of football, but uh, what the Lord had in store for me and the journey ahead of me, um, I wouldn't have changed a thing, uh, you know, not only to be sitting in front of you guys here tonight, but to get to lead a football team with so many great players, so many great coaches, the greatest fan base in the National Football League, it's not close, mm -hmm. and ultimately get to do it in a way uh, that all of those bumps along the road that, that God was right there with me for allow me to do it my way here. And that's the only time I'm going to use the word my or I hopefully tonight because everything I say it uh, when I'm working in Egan every day is about our and us and we. Um, and that we includes, um, you know, my, my relationship with Christ. Excellent. You mentioned your son. And again, welcome to both of you. We're glad you're here. Um, yeah. Um, you know, for other parents out here, I'm a parent of four as well. Um, can you say a little bit more about how your mom and dad instilled faith in you or what they did to make that happen? Or? Yeah, I, I remember, you know, kicking and screaming, um, going to church every Sunday and really not understanding the, you know, hey, what, why do we have to do this? Do you know that, you know, the Eagles play the Giants at one o'clock. What are we doing? <laughs> Um, but uh, little by little by little, without really forcing it, you know, just kind of observing their marriage, their relationship, um, which, you know, relationships are always hard, whether we're, um, you know, husband and wife, you know, father, son, friends, family, it's always hard to maintain, you know, relationships that you care about so much. And, and, and I think I just remember, I don't exactly know when it was or, or how it happened, but ultimately, um, you know, I just remember feeling like there's something there. And I know they love each other, but there's something else there. And, and just kind of learning about what that has meant. And then ultimately getting to meet, you know, my soulmate, who quite honestly has really put a stamp on everything that I thought I believed, everything that I thought was important about my faith. And we've probably grown as a, you know, our faith journey as a family um, with each and every blessing of a child or, or you know, I've moved this poor family you know, going on about eight times in the last 10 years, and we're hoping to be here a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I just, I just remember watching them and observing them, and then, and like in anything in life, um, you know, my, about my, going into my junior year, senior year of college, I don't quite remember the exact year, uh, but my grandma passed away and struggled uh, very much with cancer, you know, through the last months of her her life, but it happened to coincide with my football season. So I couldn't really spend a lot of time really kind of dealing with that and, and, and understanding what was really going on. And then I went to the funeral, and I just remember feeling like in that moment, in a church very similar to this, the connection that we all, you know, have with Christ, like that's, that's why it matters in those moments. Not even, you know, my grandma was a, a believer, strong, strong Christian woman, um, but selfishly for me, you know, confirming uh, there's no possible way that that wonderful woman, that there's nothing else. And I just remember sitting there and having so much peace, knowing where she went and knowing who she was with, that it kind of all, you know, there was, you know, the saying I tell our players sometimes, nobody can tell me nothing now, mm. you know, because uh, it just was that moment where I was, um, so ingrained in, 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 in the hope that, yeah. that our faith provides us. So the talk of this conversation is faith and leadership. Yep. So we're going to circle around both faith and leadership a little bit. You uh, mentioned uh, your time at New England uh, as a backup to a particularly talented quarterback. Um, what did you learn about leadership as a backup, uh, you know, in it may be particularly to him, or it doesn't have to be particular to him. Yeah, I think, um, you know, not only to him, but then, you know, Mark Sanchez was a rookie quarterback when I was with the Jets. That was really my first uh, introduction into, you know, a very, very certain style of leadership that I call servant leadership. Um, I'm sure you feel like, obviously, you feel that, you know, probably on an everyday basis, not only as a father, but, you know, uh, of this wonderful place as well. And there's a certain level of, 
servant leadership as a, as a backup quarterback that you're really, you're in a role, and, and I was so blessed to, to get to be a part of football teams for five years in the NFL, but no, you know, your name's never in lights, your name's never in any headlines. You know, nobody knows that great throw you had running the scout team to get the defense ready to go. <laughs> um, nobody knows any of those things. Nobody sees you, you know, taking the play sheet, you know, when you could be going home, uh, but you're going over the plays one more time with Mark so that he could call the play right that Sunday, you know, against the Patriots or uh, when Tom Brady's going through the call sheet on a Saturday night before a Sunday game and you're, you know, making sure that even he, the greatest, as great as he was, hey, is he, does he remember the alert? Does he remember the read? Does he remember what we need to do if this happens? And I found myself having a lot of those answers um, and I didn't learn and, and study like crazy for myself because I was not going to play. I did it to be a resource uh, to somebody more talented, more capable, more able than I was, but that didn't change my attitude towards whatever my role was to help the team win. And it morphed and changed and uh, a, lot of, a lot of different ways throughout my kind of five years, but uh, that was really my introduction into servant leadership uh, which then transitioned to, to obviously me eventually becoming a coach. Which was the next question I was going to ask. So um, as you made that transition, were there additional things you learned or you're still learning that were different than being a backup to the actual coach of a team now? Yeah, so my first job was in 2000, really 14, 15 with the Cleveland Browns. I was lucky enough, uh, the former defensive coordinator who I had met now coaches on our staff here in Minnesota, Mike Pettin, he was the head coach of the Cleveland Browns. And it's pretty rare to have your first job uh, be a position coach, you know, in the highest level of football, which I understood uh, at that very moment, too much is given, much is required, as we all know. Um, but I was, um, you know, I was 20, I think I was 29, 28, 29 years old at the time, and we had signed a, a quarterback who was 34 years old, a guy by the name of Josh McCown, who uh, everybody knows now is, is our new quarterback coach here in Minnesota. So talk about life becoming full circle. But um, I remember, uh, you know, first time I'm mean, gonna, I had this all, this whole meeting kind of planned out and how I was gonna help Josh and why I was the right man for the job. And he walked in the room and, um, you know, started, it wasn't a, he wasn't testing me, but a couple questions here and there. Then he kind of looked at me, he said, you can relax, man. I know you're going to be able to help me. Mm. <laughs> and I took a you know, deep, deep breath and I said, man, I'm glad we got that out of the way. And then, and then <laughs> ultimately, uh, you know, ultimately I was able to, you know, he was willing to listen, but where it all started was understanding now I'm in a role where coaching is not just about servant leadership anymore. You have to hold people accountable. You have to be willing uh, to tell them when they're doing something wrong, and most importantly, show them how to fix it, or at least the path uh, to how to fix it. And you do that by building relationships. And I think that's where um, my faith as the backbone of who I am uh, really has allowed me to identify uh, the gift of trying to connect with people, connect others together, um, build people up and their relationships up. We're probably one of the few teams in the NFL that uses the word love mm. as much as we do. Mm. Um, but it's a special thing, and it's a special thing to be in a position role where you're doing it with two or three quarterbacks. And then a few years later, I got the opportunity to be an offensive coordinator where now you have, you know, basically half the team that you're trying to do that with. And then inevitably, I, I get an opportunity to be a head coach where it's not just our team, it's hopefully our fan base, hopefully it's our, uh, our ownership and our personnel department and, and everybody in between that, uh, you know, is, once again, that too much is given, much is required. Um, I live my life by it. I wake up every morning thankful for the opportunity uh, to lead and, and by leading, I, I try to keep learning. And I think that's the one thing is, is having a growth mindset every single day. Uh, that there's mentors and there's leaders and there's motivators and there's teachers all around us every single day and to keep your eyes and ears open because I learn things every single day that help me become maybe something that I think helps me become a better coach might help me become a better father or a husband or a friend and I just I think the foundation of my faith hoping to you know push myself to be the best version that I can be of myself 
Not for any selfish reasons, although I would love to win a Super Bowl in Minnesota, I can tell you that. <laughs> but because of, you know, I, I believe once you establish that relationship with Christ, you know, there's no greater example of too much is given, much is required than, and then having that love in your life. So this, uh, this is going to be um, teasing out the question I just asked you, but um, one of the questions I've gotten now for 21 years <clears throat> about this series is, where did you get the idea for this particular speaker? I usually talk about it later when I'm thanking people, but since he sent me a question, I'm going to tee it up by telling this story. You're here tonight in a very real way because my youngest son, Andrew, you mentioned you don't have a chance to talk about your faith very often. He saw a post sometime last year when you were talking to St. Thomas Academy. I don't yep. know if you remember that. Yep. So Andrew pinged me and said, you know, you should see if you can get Coach to come. Um, and Justin, Leah's husband, it looks like you won the toss on who was going to come tonight. But thank Justin. He works there, and he was very helpful in finding the people to get to you. But my son, Andrew, is now a first-year student at West Point. Oh, wonderful. Which is a, a big leadership academy, yep. right? So I literally pinged him today. I said, hey, you have a question about leadership for the coach tonight. And here's his question. And again, it's sort of related to what you just said. How do you lead by example to your players if you are, are in a different role as, from them, i.e. not actually practicing, working out, or playing? Yeah, I think uh, you know, leading by example in its purest form is being... Uh, first and foremost, I should, it's a great question if he's listening. And he is, and by the way, I should have said that. Great hi, question. Hi, Andrew, and any friends who are with you. And we'll see you soon, buddy. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, two major, major pillars of, of how I lead and try to uh, attempt to be the same person every day and the best version of myself is really through two things, authenticity and humility. Uh, because I believe once your players establish that it's you, the person in front of them every single day, that's Kevin. Uh, we know what we're going to get from him. We know he's going to hold us accountable for the things we're not doing uh, up to our standards that, once again, there's that word, our, which we establish together. Um, they know that uh, there's going to be nothing about me and my role that is about me. It's about them. It's about um, ultimately sacrificing so much of uh, my life to this team, um, and they know I'm doing it out of love for them, the love I have of seeing them succeed, the love really what makes anybody who's a coach in the room, you know that the best part of being a coach is when you see a weakness, you, you identify a weakness, you not only identify the weakness, but you teach a player the path to turning that weakness into a strength, and then you see them do it, and the look on their face when they're able to do that. And sometimes that helps teams win championships. Sometimes it helps a team get a third down against a really good defense. But in the end, you see that, that look on their face and you know that it's about them, but they know that you had every bit to do with helping them accomplish that. And how many times can you add those little wins up that we eventually have together and the players don't look at it like I'm on the sideline and they're on the field they know ultimately that we're in it together. And I think the most important time to be authentic, you know, you know, have that humility is in times of struggle. And the way you do that is you take ownership of it. Um, you guys may not even notice, but uh, I'll, anytime we ever lose a game, um, no matter what the question is to me after a game, um, it's always going to start out with what I could have done better. It's always going to start out with, uh, you know, I may not say it like Bill Belichick when he said, we got to coach better, we got to play better, we got to tackle better. <laughs> but in my own way, I'm, I'm always going to take accountability first. And it's going to be authentic and it's going to be real. I'm not going to make something up. Uh, but you coach a quarter, or better, better than that, you coach one play in the NFL, there's always something you could do better. There's always a better play call you could have made. There's always a better way you could have reached your team. There's always a better way you could have reached a player. Um, and when you lose, you take accountability for that. And then eventually, you know, you never want to deflect so much that your players are immune to taking that responsibility. That's a whole different series as far as young people taking uh, responsibility and handling adversity well in society. I think it's a, something we all got to try to figure out a, a way to help uh, our young people today. That's, that's a whole side 
you have another series yeah. coming up that we could spend <laughs> well, time? As a matter of fact, you'd be welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but ultimately, it's amazing, you know, when you do those things. And, and what I say to the media, what I say at the podium, um, that's probably, you know, 5% of giving myself to the team and the emotion that, that happens when those locker room, locker room doors close. And it's just myself and, and our coaches and our team in there after a win or a loss. But the key is after losses, it's my fault. And after wins, it's because of you guys. And I try to live by that no matter how it goes. Uh, even if I have a pretty sweet play call to win the game or something like that, it's <laughs> still about those guys. And, uh, you know, it's, it's ultimately going to be uh, if you can be like that no matter what, and it gets really hard when you know that taking responsibility for this loss today is going to make people upset. And they're going to want to say, hey, he blamed himself. We should blame him too. And that would be worrying about the wrong things. That would be worrying about everything else that I shouldn't be, which is, you know, the noise on the outside that could possibly take away 0.1% of my energy that needs to be directed at our football team. Um, you've been talking a lot, obviously, about coaching, about teaching, about mentoring. Um, are there people who have been important mentors to you? And what do you think? How, what do you think mentorship has looked like when you've been on the receiving end of it? Yeah, I think uh, there definitely has been. I think back to um, different coaches and, and people I've been around in my life as a player. And uh, you know, uh, Bill Belichick, he's become. Uh, I should say coach, just in case he's listening tonight. Um, but surprisingly enough, the, the day I got hired uh, by the Cleveland Browns, uh, you know, I, he didn't, I didn't have his phone number at the time, um, and he got a message to me, and it just said, Kevin, I'm so proud of you, mm. Coach Belichick. Mm. And I got that, I still have it. And uh, first time we played against him, I went to midfield, shook his hand, and he said, I'm just so proud of you for getting into this crazy journey and profession and you seem to be doing great and then the next time and the next time and uh, I don't know if you guys remember but in uh, Thanksgiving night of my first season we played the New England Patriots and we were able to beat the New England Patriots that night and um, before the game he told me uh, you know how proud he was of me and you're doing a great job and uh, immediately started to try to ask me about you know, hey, what are you guys going to do, you know, on third down? <laughs> you know, there was always a reason why he was doing it. But, but I know Leah remembers this, but that night, you know, he held the team buses from leaving U.S. Bank Stadium for about 40 minutes. And he just came in my office at the stadium, and him and I sat and just talked. And it was one of those things where I knew this mentor of mine that was, you know, for, for so much of my life since I met the man, um, was now, he considered me a colleague now. He considered me, um, you know, and I, I was texting with him this morning, and now that he's not coaching for a team, you know, I, I feel like maybe I might get the best stuff yet out of him. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but he would definitely be one, and then fast forward uh, to the team I worked for right before I got a chance to come here, uh, the Los Angeles Rams. One of my very best friends in the whole world is a guy named Sean McVay. Mm. Um, he... I became friends with him randomly at the Combine. My first year coaching, I'm walking down a long hallway, and there's this young blonde guy with spiky hair, and he's got all this energy, and he comes up. He's like, uh, hey, you're Kevin O'Connell, right? And he's like, I'm Sean McVay. I'm the tight ends coach of, I don't even know what they're called anymore, the, the team in Washington, but I'm the tight ends coach <laughs> of, uh, of that team. And, uh, and he said, uh, I just heard you're a really smart, good guy. But, you know, you want to you wanna, you know, maybe get together sometime and talk ball. So fast forward, you know, nine, I'm actually coaching for that team in Washington in 2019, and it's the morning after our last game, he calls me and says, you know, I want you to be the offensive coordinator of the Los Angeles Rams. And I said, you know, I might have a chance to stay here, Sean, you never know, Coach Rivera might keep me. I got off the phone with him, I remember thinking to myself, am I nuts? I get a chance to go coach, you know, for, you know, one of my close friends, be around a guy who's built a culture, who has that type of leadership style that, that I've always wanted to continue to solidify in myself and, and couldn't get there fast enough. Got a chance to be around him every day. And, and he literally says to me the first day I, I walked in to start my job, he said, hey, you're the coordinator, but you're going to be more than that here. Every time I've got a tough decision to make, Every time I have to release a player, every time we trade for a player, 
you're going to sit in my office and you're going to hear how it really goes. You're going to learn how to talk to players, how to, you know, understand just that moment when you tell them that their dream is over. You're no longer going to be an NFL football player. How you do that to still hopefully allow them to walk out the door failing forward to whatever they're on to next. Mm. And just everything about my time there, which ended with, you know, us, you know, Caden being on the field with me winning a Super Bowl. Um, everything with that journey, you know, through Coach Belichick and our growing relationship to one of my best friends and Sean McVay, you couldn't have two more different people, but totally impactful on my life. And, and then ultimately, the last thing I would say is, I mean it. I mean what I say when mentors are all around us every single day. If you have the mindset to listen and, and not be the one talking all the time, I know that's odd tonight because I tend to get a little long-winded. <laughs> but if you're willing to listen, see, observe, um, you can learn new things every single day about people and um, people's backgrounds, where they come from, what makes them who they are. And then right about that moment that you've listened enough, maybe it's time to to you know, maybe say something of your own, uh, for, for yourself to, to lead, teach, motivate, whatever it is. But there's always a place to just listen. And, and I learn things from our players. I learn things from other coaches. I learn things from our fans. When I'm at Home Depot and somebody says, just before I die, coach, just before I die. <laughs> the, Depending on, you know, depending on how old they, they look, I say, how much time do I actually have? But, but, uh, but no, I, I think that's really important that people understand that there are uh, places, to, if you have a growth mindset, that it's all around for us to see, and it doesn't always have to be a positive. Mm. You know, there's a lot of that in our world today where you can learn from others, uh, you know, mistakes and, and maybe, you know, them not being on the correct path and, and not even understanding how or why. I'm going to ask you a couple more questions, and then again, we'll open it up for a period of Q&A. Uh, you all probably have much smarter questions than I have. And again, if you're online, again, social at spdlc.org is the email. Um, most of the questions I've been asking, again, are sort of broadly about faith or leadership. This is the one question I'll ask you. This, it actually comes from another young man from this congregation who sent it to his mom. I don't know if she's here, but... Um, I don't know why he didn't send it directly to me, but in any case, um, here's a question. This is sort of a, a football-specific one, but related to leadership and how yep. do you make decisions, right? Yep. So he says, there's a debate on if it's better to start a rookie quarterback right away, like C.J. Stroud, or to have the rookie quarterback sit and learn before starting, like Jordan Love. Is this a player-to-player -player or player-by-player -player decision? And if so, what are some indicators you're looking for to decide if the rookie is ready to be the starter? Yeah, I think, um, you know, first and foremost, it's absolutely a individual basis thing. Every single quarterback that, uh, you know, comes into the NFL, we're all in some ways on a football journey. The quarterback journey is different than any other journey, any other player. Um, can take because it's probably the one position where your physical skills mean the least when you get to the NFL because mm -hmm. in so many ways you know so many shapes and forms offenses you know defenses the intricacies of our game um, you know the college game it's a great game I love it. so many great things about the college game maybe not the NIL rules and all that stuff but um, I just think the National Football League with where it's gotten to with you know, 20, 20 plus years of guys like Bill Belichick coaching defense and, and, and elite football and you know, the offensive minds like Kyle Shanahan, Sean McVay, um, the, the football itself um, can consume guys, you know, like in a lot of ways it did to me my rookie year. And I truly feel like um, one, of, one of my strengths, especially in understanding that position, is understanding my failures. And um, with that, understanding that talent and intangibles and athletic ability and all the things that we spend day and night trying to evaluate over these last couple months will still lead to the starting point, hopefully, for the guy that we want to come to Minnesota and, and start their quarterback journey. And I'm a firm believer that um, by the time, the, the right time to play that player um, it's not going to be, it will be me making the decision, 
but uh, you know it's going to be Justin Jefferson or Jordan Addison or T.J. Hawkinson or our offensive coordinator or Josh McCown or um, Brian Flores coming to me and saying, "How are you not playing this guy?" And eventually, and it doesn't have to be years. I think the Jordan Love situation was pretty unique because you know they basically had one Hall of Fame quarterback to another one. And then he got to really wait and wait. And even when he started playing, the player we saw at the end of last year was different than the, the player that was playing for the team. We went up to Lambeau and beat by a couple touchdowns earlier in the season. Um, so everybody's on their own journey. Uh, but I do feel the best way to prepare them for that moment is to find your own ways of quarterback development, to expose them to little bits and pieces of adversity here and there, see how they respond, see how their teammates respond. And then ultimately after doing all that, they're still gonna come a Sunday uh, where they throw the ball to the other team two or three times and uh, everybody's mad and, and, and after that game, it will for sure be my fault, I promise you that. <laughs> um, but, but ultimately, how we, how we wake up, how we, how we grow that very next day all the way through the next opportunity because through true adversity is where greatness can grow. And uh, you ask anybody, Tom Brady was the 199th pick in the draft, almost lost his job twice at, uh, you know, at Michigan. And his rookie year, actually, uh, he told me a story one time because uh, he said he loved going to San Diego to play at the old Qualcomm Stadium uh, because the hot dogs were really good. And I said, <laughs> I said, you ate a hot dog during the game? He said, oh yeah, no, I used to walk through the concourse, go up and, and go to the concession stand after the team got done warm up, because he, he was the fourth quarterback. He wasn't suiting up for games. He'd go up, get a, you know, a, 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 you know, a hot dog and a, and a Pepsi and, and enjoy himself, and then come back down to the field for the game. And now, and now he's you know, you know, the greatest, you know, maybe uh, you know, greatest NFL football player to ever live. And, um, his journey started out like that. So um, I've told that story to some, some of our players before, and, and every single time their reaction's the same way. Um, but I think it's just it's important that uh, when the time is right, that player will be ready to play, and we'll be on our way to, to win a Lombardi trophy. Yeah. All right, last question from me, um, and then I'll let you rest your voice, and I've got a couple of announcements before we go to the Q&A. But the last question for me is, and I don't, I'm not sure how much time you have outside of your very high-pressure job, but outside of football, you know, what, what brings you joy? What do you love to do that's outside the game of football? Well, I incredibly enjoy being a very below-average golfer. That would be, <laughs> you know, in fact, Caden's probably about a, a, a couple, uh, you know, questionable scorecard uh, entries from me from beating me, so uh, we've got... We've got a, a couple of days, uh, that'll probably happen this spring actually. So when it happens, just remember all these lessons about servant leadership and all that <laughs> stuff. Uh, but uh, I absolutely, nothing, nothing will beat the time that I have with my family. Because I do feel, it happened the other day. Um, I was lucky enough to go down, I got invited to go down to the Masters. Oh, um, and spend a couple days down there. And, and even when I got the invite, the, in my mind I know that I'm going to go and I'm going to come back and our youngest, she's about 18 months, Callie Grace, mm. um, I'm going to come back and she's going to be different. And uh, when I got home on, uh, on Sunday, um, she came walking down the hall and she looks up at me and she was like, yes, <laughs> out of nowhere. And when I left to go to the master, she really wasn't saying a whole lot. <laughs> and she was about two inches taller. She's got teeth coming in. I said, what? Um, but ultimately, um, that is, I, like, it, it, my life is very simple. It really is. It's, I can't be at enough Little League games or dance recitals or uh, get an opportunity to spend time with Leah as much as possible. Um, and, and, and like I said, it's, it's, it's precious time um, because I do have to give so much of of, of the time we have during a, a day, and I, I test the limits. I, I'm a little bit of an early guy, and I like to say I'm an early guy, but then I, I start staying a little later and staying a little later, and it shouldn't be, it's the off season. I should be home for dinner, and every single night I'm eating um, what I, I, it's phenomenal, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but I normally have to reheat it because I miss the, you know, the first seating of dinner at the O'Connell house, so. 
Um, it's, it's just the, it's the life we live right now. I will, I do want to say this, though, um, because I could not dedicate so much of my time, my energy, you know, every bit of my being, it seems like sometimes, with, uh, with four children without that lady sitting right over there. So. <laughs> And I, and, I, and I say that because when I come home, I'm not dad coming home. I'm basically the fifth child coming home. <laughs> you know, I end up hovering around the kitchen or, you know, leaving my stuff all over the place. And so she basically has to, you know, take care of me as well. But I, I really am so thankful for you and love you so much. All right. You can rest your voice for a second. Um, I'm going to make a couple quick announcements here. Uh, I mentioned this is the last of our uh, events for this year's season. Um, and so I will tell, we've actually got all five events for next year booked. I'm not gonna tell you all of them tonight. I'm gonna tell you a couple. So I want you feel free to put this first, the first one on your calendar will be October 10th. Um, it'll be here in the sanctuary and it'll feature someone many of you will likely have heard of named Lori Line. So we're actually gonna maybe even build out the stage a little bit, we'll bring a piano up and she'll both speak and also play. Wow. So, uh, and Beth, thank you for the suggestion. <laughs> uh, October 10th. The other one I'll tell you about is um, someone you likely also have heard of, and this one, it'll be in the middle of this series uh, in February, February 6th, and that's a guy named Daryl Strawberry. Wow. I like it. <laughs> So please come back for those. Uh, do all the things. Sign up on social media. Follow us on, on Facebook and Instagram. Sign up to get emails. You can learn how to do that here. Um, and we, we won't fill your e email box, but we'll alert you to those events. And the other three speakers we have are also awesome. And actually, I'll just tell you, the series will conclude. Um, it's almost exactly a year from now, uh, April 24th. Uh, which I believe is the Thursday after Easter with New York Times columnist David Brooks, who I, boy, a lot of booze. <laughs> I like it. I've been working on David Brooks for about 20 years, so um, please come to that. Uh, so then I also want to say a word of thanks. For 21 years, these events have been free and open to the public. I've heard from many of you who are here from the first, for the first time tonight writing me saying, hey, do I need a ticket? Do I need to sign up? Do I need to register? And from the very beginning, I felt very strongly that we needed to make them open and accessible so that anyone could come. And I'm so glad all of you are here tonight. I'm so glad those of you online are joining us. That means, though, that someone has to pay the bill to make all of this work, and it's not the budget of the church. I want to be very clear about that. It has not been from the very beginning. From the start of this series, I started at a different church I was at, and it followed me here. Um, the series has been paid for entirely and completely through the generosity of individuals and organizations who underwrite it and support it incredibly generously. Um, so I want to just thank, I'm not, you see the names of those who are willing to be listed in your, in your program. Thank you to all of them. Uh, I will lift up our corporate sponsors, Crossroad Financials, uh, Financial Group, Cressa, Ulrich Real Estate, Mally Design, Productivity, Rapid Packaging, and Mastercraft Labels. Um, I just could not be more grateful for 21 years of partnership with the people who make this series possible financially. Many of them are here tonight. Will you join me in thanking them for making this possible? Um, and then I also want to give a shout out to our friend Jeff. Jeff Elstad's our guitarist. He's been with us from the very start. He had a little extra work tonight to play a little longer than usual, so thank you, my friend. Thank We're, you for that, yeah. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had no idea why uh, Coach was going to be late. He literally, I don't know when you touched down, but, and I don't know where he went, I'm, and if I did, I wouldn't say. <laughs> But he flew out this morning, and he was literally on his driving back from the airport to get here in time. So you've had a busy day, so thank you. All right. Um, yeah. Oh. Final thing. 
Coach was very generous. He uh, gave us a ball that's signed by him. Um, we have never, I don't recall ever having done this before. I have no idea if this is gonna work. And no, I'm not gonna throw it to someone. <laughs> um, some lucky individual, I hope, has a program tonight. And if you look at it under Coach's picture, there is a little purple sticker. And there's only one of those. So now that I just said that, I don't, none of you could have come tonight with purple stickers in your pocket, I hope. Uh, does anyone see that? Are you serious? <laughs> oh, you got it. All right. Yes, please. Go on. Could go anywhere. Yes, give me Thank some. You very much. Absolutely, Thank there you go. Thank you. I hope that's legal what we just did. I don't even know. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, time for some questions. We'll, this is always a little bit of a gut check. Again, he, coach has got to get off to uh, whatever you've got going after this, which I'm assuming is going to bed. Um, sure hope so. Yeah. Uh, so we'll spend a little time uh, taking some questions, and uh, I'm sure I have some, but if anyone here in the house wants to stand up and kick us off. Um, okay. There we go. Hey, Coach. Um, Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, that's something I, I never heard, so that's a first for me. Yeah. <laughs> I really enjoyed listening to you tonight um, with your experience being a quarterback, going through the NFL, and then transitioning into being a coach. Has there been any experience or time, especially now that you are a coach, where you're like, ah, this is something that I need to make sure players understand no matter what stage they are in their career, but this is what they need to know to be successful in the NFL. Yeah, I think it's, first of all, a great question. What was your name again? Luke. Luke. Um, so as of this Monday, so when I first got the job here, first off-season program came, um, and I, my first meeting, I'll never, I'll never forget it, I scheduled it for 15 minutes, first team meeting, 8 a.m., 2022, 20, and... Uh, well, I went 37 minutes, and all I talked about, you know, that just won a Super Bowl, um, didn't mention that, just, you know, hey, I'm not know what offense we're going to be running, defense we're going to be running. Uh, what I talked about was what our culture was going to be like in our building. And I think the most important thing for any of our players, because we have a lot of new ones this year, we've lost some unbelievable leaders, unbelievable people. You guys all know so many of those those folks, and uh, I started the meeting out Monday, and I, I went for 41 minutes. I schedule it for 40 minutes because I've started to learn a little bit more about myself. Uh, but and I talked a lot about I, it was it was basically called our culture reload, and we have a shield that if you guys ever get a, ever come to um, our facility in Egan, there's shields. We call them our culture shields around the building. It says our team, our way, our process. And I systematically built from basically the ground up why that matters. And uh, I like to teach them that it's not about me or any of our coaches. It's about them, their locker room, and their team. Um, and ultimately, what that leads to is players feeling like they have ownership of their team. And I think that's the most important thing for anybody that comes to Minnesota. But it was also important for our players that have been here for the last two years um, to understand that we will never forget the foundational things that uh, we feel uh, lead to a world championship process, which will hopefully get us to that result one day. But I do believe when we do achieve that result, doing it the way we do it and the, t the, the level of feelings we have for one another in our building and, and, and what that leads to only makes it that much more um, worthy to, to be something to strive to accomplish every day. Absolutely. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate it, Luke. Hey, Coach. Thanks for being here. Full transparency. Oh, jeez. I did not know that you were a believer, but it does not surprise me at all in the way you act, the culture that you built. Um, you know, right now, the, the world needs Jesus, and you're seeing a revival. 
in popular faith, popular groups, popular things. And I implore you to continue to spread that and use your, your platform to do that. And I have no doubts that you will, but I uh, just wanted to say thank you for, for doing that. No, I appreciate you saying that. And you're exactly right. My name is Elizabeth. As you can tell, I'm a really big fan of yours. <laughs> My question is that, um, what's your favorite quote to tell the players when they're having a bad day on the field? Yes. Um, my favorite quote, um, let me see if I can get this right. I actually used it on Monday. Uh, it's basically, uh, it's a quote, golly, if I can remember it. I had it on a PowerPoint. I swear it was really good. <laughs> uh, but uh, basically, it, it, it's along the lines of, of what you are like, you know, during the during the drought, so that's really what it is, is, is how, you know, how, we, how we are in the drought uh, will be ultimately what leads us to what we become at harvest. And, and meaning uh, what we are at our worst and, and what we are when things are as hard as you can possibly imagine, when everybody's doubting us, when nobody believes in us, um, what we are and how we band together in those moments are gonna be the reason why we eventually uh, reap the rewards of a harvest, and um, I think that's words to live by for all of us. And really, and I can just I can just tell if you're in this room tonight, and 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 you have you know faith and as part of your life, uh, we've all been through some things, but we all know what it felt like uh, when we had that moment of of triumph and and uh, moment of uh, joy at the end of a, a long time, a long hard road. And and in sports and life, there's so many things that carry over to one another, but I appreciate you asking me that. I will make sure that I have that quote memorized and next time. one more time. thing, Kevin. Um, I think you should keep Harrison Phillips. Okay. <laughs> Harrison Phillips is one of my favorite players. And, and, and I, I happen to agree. What Harrison does in the community and, and the amount of, of, of Vikings fans and beyond that he uh, impacts, it's truly remarkable. So if you haven't met Harrison or you don't know uh, much about him, I think you got somebody over there you can ask about. She seems to <laughs> be a big fan. All right, Kathy. Hi, Coach. Thanks for being here. Um, Fully transparent. I'm a Pittsburgh Steeler fan, but I do root for the Vikings okay. when they're not playing the Steelers. Okay. I just I have to be transparent about that. My question is, do you see the NFL players becoming uh, or showing their faith more yep. in today's world or less in today's world? We seem to have gotten away from praising God, um, and I want to know if you think the players are starting to show their faith more. I think they are, and I think, um, you know, the, look, it's, it's hard to go through um, really a week in an NFL season without there being some, some sort of, uh, you know, and I, and I think inclusion is a, is a very important thing um, in our society, but I also think faith is as well, and I think it's okay um, to, you know, you know when, you, when you win a game and uh, you know, I know for a fact when Kirk, before Kirk was putting on those chains or before J.J. does a gritty, I know exactly what they're thinking. Um, they're thanking their Lord and Savior uh, for the opportunity to be uh, even able to be in a situation like that. And so I know in our building it's strong. Um, we have a very, very strong, um, you know, group of players. We've, we've got guys that uh, we have a weekly Bible study. We have chapel and, and, and church services the night before games in the hotel, both at home, on the road. Um, so my hope is that's happening more and more. And, if, and, and, and normally, when players get the opportunity to do that, it's normally a really good thing for the team. Uh, so I hope we more and more and more that, that we can do that. And you know what? I think I need to do it as well. i like to see it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Why don't we go over to this side? And by the way, we are getting a lot of questions online. I will try to insert one, of, one or two of those if I can. I just want you to know I'm, I'm getting them. And we'll We've got to, time. We, you okay? I'm, I'm gonna, okay, all right. Nice to see you again, Coach. The last time we met was at training camp, and I was even more purple then, so sorry I'm not painted up for the horns and the weapons, but we're in church too, so. Um, but uh, 
first, thanks for, for, for of course, for being here. Um, I just want to correct thing. We want you to win Super Bowls. Plural. Got it. So, so that's a little directive as a longtime super fan here. So, um, in that regard, so I do want to first pay you a compliment. That you're coaching in-game coaching with Josh Jobs in that first game against Atlanta. I'm 60 years old. I watched football since I was his age and younger, kind of thing. Um, best in-game coaching I have ever seen by any coach anywhere, and I'm including Bud in that whole thing too. So, yeah. Um, that was a fantastic. Thing. So. One quickie question, though, based off the Tom Brady story about the hot dogs, are you going to be taking your next quarterback to get some hot dogs in San Diego during the summer? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a shame there's not an NFL team in San Diego anymore, yeah. I can tell you that much. But, but if but... it worked that way, I'm just, just saying. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny about that Josh Dobbs game? So he, he arrived in Minnesota. He landed at about you know 9 a.m. on that Wednesday before uh, we went down there. And there was just something about like I saw him at the first practice and we were getting ready to play Jaron Hall and it was going to be his first start. So I had to totally pour into Jaron and make sure he knew that I was with him every step of the way. But there was something about it uh, that I kept on kind of just, you know, like a magnet drawing me to Josh Dobbs of, you know, at some point uh, we're going to need this guy. I didn't think it would be four days later, but um, <laughs> at some point and him and I established such a rapport pretty quickly, and, and I don't know whether, you know, his journey has been one of filled with trials and tribulations, and he's, you know, it wasn't his first time being with a new team and, and having to play, but um, I'll never forget, right before the kickoff of that game, I walked over to him and I said, hey, rest easy. If you're going to go in the game today, it's me and you out there together all day. And he said, I know, coach. And then after the game, he said, he came up to me. I gave him the game ball. It was an awesome scene in the locker room. And, you know, he looked at me in front of the team. He said, coach said it was me and him all day, but it was me and you guys all day to the rest of the team. Um, and, and just the moments. And, and it didn't end the way we wanted by any stretch. But uh, that moment will stick with me. That game that day will stick with me as long as I coach because... Thank goodness for the walkie-talkie, that's all I would say. <laughs> uh, by the end of that game, I think he was, he was trying to unplug it out of his headset because <laughs> he just heard this voice for three hours straight. But uh, no, it was a blast. It was a lot of fun. Closest I ever got to actually being a successful NFL quarterback. <laughs> it, again, it was a great job. Where we, I host uh, viewing parties for super fans or you know, for games and stuff like that. We were watching, and so many people were commenting on that. Yeah. Too. And like I said, it was just, it was tremendous to see because so many coaches coach through their players. I know that were their coaches. I know that's what Bud always said he did and stuff too. But you were just right there as, as hands on as possible. And again, in, in all of the games that I have seen, Vikings and otherwise, that was the best game coaching Thank I've seen you. by a coach. So that's yeah. the exact part. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being here. Again, I know everyone's been saying it, but truly grateful that you're here. Uh, so I myself, I'm a fairly new coach. I'm super young and I'm just trying to learn as best I can. And something I learned from you that I'm trying to instill in all my 12-year-old soccer boys is uh, something I heard you say kind of time after time in the locker room post-game after a win is uh, being at your best when your best is required. Yep. And uh, I guess my question for you is how do you apply that to your life, not as a player or a coach, but as maybe a disciple and a follower of Christ? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's a great question. And I think those moments, um, the, the hard part is to answer that question, you don't know what's ahead. Um, I, you know, I don't know when somebody, uh, there's been times, you know, either as a coach or a father or a husband or just a friend where um, the phone rings and, and somebody's really going through something and, and you've got to try to find the right thing to say back and you know what you do to be at your best when your best is required there. Rely on what you rely on the most. And, and that's where I always seem to um, feel like I'm gonna struggle in those moments, but then clarity comes. And you know exactly where that's coming from. And I think, uh, you know, the, the, that, that would be the one thing I'd say is trust in your faith in those moments, because that's what I do. And I'm not always perfect and, and none of us ever are. Um, but we are, you know, we, we do have that within us to have an unbelievable impact, you know, being a vessel for that kind of power. And 
in love. So, but that's awesome. Do we have a record yet? Have we played any games yet? Not yet. First game is uh, May 2nd. The best feeling ever is when you're O and O, man. It's all up here. <laughs> well, thank you. We're, we're O and six over the last two preseasons, and <laughs> nobody remembers that. Yeah, let's go over to the, let's, we're alternating yeah, over here. Hey, Coach, uh, my name is Takashi, and you're all obviously a very bu busy person with your, you know, family and team and, you know, owners that you have to deal with as well as all the fans, right? Um, and one of the things I struggle with, I believe a lot of us do struggle with, is when we get so busy, we just don't have the time for God. So I'm just curious as to how, how would you maintain your faith amidst the chaos on a daily basis. It's funny you ask that. I was actually asking uh, our team chaplain um, the other night, and another mentor of mine that I, that I should have mentioned that I'm going to see tomorrow night is a, a guy named Tony Dungy. Um, yeah. So Coach Dungy um, literally has said, he asked me, when do you pray? And, you know, I said, you know, for sure, before games and, <laughs> you know, any moment that, you know, that I can find. But what I actually started doing, um, believe it or not, and this was his, his idea, was I have about a 17-minute commute in the morning. And a lot of times there's not very many folks on the road. Um, it's probably the most peaceful time. And I started kind of using that time, you know, driving in to make sure um, that I'm just kind of checking in for the day. And, um, it seems to, you know, it, it seems to give me energy, give me some juice for the day. And, um, but it's a huge, it's a thing we all go through, right? It's, you, you catch yourself, you know, three, four, five days, whatever it is, and, and uh, you feel almost a guilt. And, and that guilty feeling is that hunger inside you to need to, to, need to find that connection. And, and I think that's really important. So I've, I've found driving, as hard as it is not to, you know, you know, call people back in California, mom, dad, friends, and all those things. Um, that's why I do it in the morning, because it's about 4 a.m., 3 a.m. back there. Um, so, but I, that, that's what I would recommend, is trying to find time, whether it's in a workout, you're on a treadmill, you're, you know, th those times where you can't be doing anything else, but you're not doing something so important that your focus would be pulled away. Thanks, Coach. All right, I am going to, I'm going to ask one question from our online uh, folks, just so they know that <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. Um, I'm a school administrator. We have times where our teachers feel overwhelmed, un, unappreciated by parents, and struggling to, say, to stay positive. What type of message do you have for your players or coaching staff when things aren't always going the way you want, but still want them to know they're valued and appreciated? Yeah, I would say uh, any, any and all victories, as small as they may be, you know, those, those should be celebrated. And when I say that, it, it may be, you know, just one impactful moment with a student or, you know, you have a day full of hard, hard moments, hard things happen, but there was that one thing that you can look back on and say, in that moment, that's why I do what I do. And I know teachers are great, great people. Um, especially, you know, uh, yeah, I think back to some of the great teachers that I've had in life and, you know, there was no reason for them to care about me as much as they did, other than that, it, you know, they truly had passion and love for what they do, and um, it's not always going to be something where uh, you, he you hear praise and, and, and people are giving you a pat on the back saying, great job, uh, you know, but it's something that, in, in the end, I think the most important thing is staying true to your process and, and making uh, every single day about that process, not the result, because when you're a results-driven person, uh, when that result happens and you don't get the reward, you're gonna focus on that versus uh, the process that led you there and then how consistent can you be with that? Even in the face of doubt, turmoil, uh, people thinking, you know, people having a problem with the way you do things, it sure sounds a lot like being an NFL coach in a lot of ways. Um, and that's okay because people don't always need to understand as long as you're doing the things that you believe uh, are for the right reasons and come from the right foundation and, and uh, stay true to who you are. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, hi, Coach. Um, I think of uh, another player, uh, Kirk, uh, just left. Uh, but 
Uh, he's another outspoken Christian. Yep. And I wanted to ask, um, when you're dealing with other Christians on the team, do you find it's a lot easier to build a deeper relationship or um, have a greater sense of accountability or um, even maybe easier to encourage players who are sharing your faith and you can talk to on that level? Yeah, a lot of times those those one-on-one -on -one conversations when they, I'm able, you know, a lot of times I share those things and I do uh, in front of the team and those closed door meetings the night before games and things like that, I always, um, if I've said how blessed are we or how unbelievable is it that we're so blessed to be in this room together tonight, uh, they know and then you get those one-off conversations and in many ways, um, kind of in line with, um, with a previous question, in many ways through other people's struggles and adversity are when I feel like it's my my chance to, you know, really, uh, you know, have my faith come out of me because I can tell people that I've been through some things and, and I've experienced failures and I've experienced sorrow. And in those moments, what I, what I really focused on turning to was my faith. And I came out better on the other side and you will too. And a lot of times, whether guys are believers or not, uh, you know, they turn to their faith. I've had coaches, I've had players, you know, lose a loved one, brothers and sisters. Um, last year, I remember, uh, didn't really get reported or anything, but we had a practice squad player um, whose uh, brother was shot and killed that morning. And he got the call, you know, right before our offensive install kind of started. And uh, I saw him kind of get up, see it. He took the phone call, and he didn't come back. And then when I, it was about an hour later when I got done installing, like, the base pass plan, and I walked back into my office and he was sitting in one of the chairs in front of my desk and he just was crying almost uncontrollably and he didn't want to leave until he could tell me why he was leaving. And I told him, first and foremost, we're gonna get you to the airport as fast as possible and get home. Um, but those moments and what I shared with him in those moments, you know, I, I think those are the times that you really are, are thankful that you're in a position that somebody cares about you in a leadership role enough to come to you when they could have really turned to anybody in those moments. And what I said to him, and, and he's, you know, we've talked a lot about it since, and, and he's doing great now, but um, those are the moments you remember. As much as you remember Josh Dobbs against the Falcons, you remember those moments. Um, and I can remember the feeling like it was yesterday of, uh, you know, feeling more pressure in that moment to deliver than any football game I could possibly ever coach. Thank you. Hey, Coach. Uh, collaboration is a word that you and the whole building use so yep. very frequently. Um, what would you say is a strategy that you like to employ, or do you find using a lot when collaboration is maybe not at the forefront of other people's agenda? Yeah, I think the way you collaboration is the byproduct of having elite communication, and I do believe that you know where uh, elite communication lacks in anything in life. Uh, negativity can fill the void, whether it's intentional or unintentional. Uh, unintentional. Um, how you collaborate is by getting in the room, speaking to each other. Uh, our general manager and I, you know, we make sure every single day that, that there's time for just him and I to have conversations about, uh, it could be a current player or a team, uh, ownership, uh, you know, what we're going to do in the draft, it's a daily thing that, um, you know, everybody wants to throw around buzzwords like culture and collaboration and communication and all these C's uh, that you can throw out there, but they're all things that you roll up your sleeves and you actually have to physically do. You actually actually pour into making intentional that those things are something that matter to you. And that's all a part of building relationships, building trust. Uh, building competency in a relationship that people can rely on you. Um, you do what you say and you say what you do and you do it over and over and over again until it becomes the standard of how everybody around you has to operate with you. And if you have enough touch points around a group of people, pretty soon that's going to be the standard around the building. Wonderfully said. Thank you, Coach. Yeah, thank you. So I just want to do a time check, Coach. It's a, I, I committed to you to be done by about quarter till, so we got about six, seven I'm minutes. I'm going to speed up my answers. Here we go. All right. We, Lightning, we, round. All right. <laughs> Lightning round. Lightning Hi. round, yeah. Hey, Coach. Uh, Peter Romstead, lifelong fan. Um, my question for you is, has there ever been like a game or like a play that like 
you've just looked at it and you just said, that was God right there. Like, you just think like God into it. <laughs> Do you remember when Justin Jefferson caught the ball like that? <laughs> I was, I was standing right there about as far from me to you when it happened, and I think there was about 70,000 people in Orchard Park, New York, that said that was God right there. Because <laughs> uh, that's sure, that sure as, as, as all get up is what I felt in that moment, for sure. Great question, though. And I've actually, uh, I've only talked about that with God, about feeling like that in that moment, so now all you guys know that. But great question. Hi, Coach. Um, my question with the big day coming up next week on Thursday, when you look at the draft and you look at all these quarterbacks that have come in at number one picks or even below that, Ryan Leaf, for example, yep. and they don't make it in the NFL, what are you looking at as far as leadership with an NFL quarterback? Or what is something maybe you're looking at that we don't see? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that I've been fortunate enough to do this spring is, is is travel and, and uh, spend some time with them kind of on their turf. Um, I believe in the process of, of seeing them around their teammates, seeing them around um, their schools. Um, we did a, you know, kind of a cool thing where in each spot um, I had the player kind of pick a place to either have lunch or dinner. And you know, the, 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 really the only, re the only requirement was that I was gonna pay for it. But, you guys pick the spot. You guys let us know uh, where we're going. Um, and I really wanted to see how they interacted with people, um, whether, you know, did they, you know, did they take every photo that somebody wanted to take with them? Did they sign every autograph for, for somebody? Did they, uh, did they handle the moment the right way, even though they knew uh, that, shoot, coach is only going to be here for so long? Um, things like that. I think just learning about people. But my job... Uh, you know, not only just as the head coach, but I'm going to have a direct one-on-one -on -one relationship. And I feel responsible that whoever we bring here, uh, it's my job to develop uh, whatever they maybe aren't comfortable with or can be perceived as not having in the moment. It's my job to bring that out of them. And I think that that's a huge thing. And that's why we spend the time, you know, getting to know these guys as much as we do. Um, but then the number one thing I always like to look at is, I love to watch when adversity hits. And sometimes it hits more for others than, than some guys, but there's always a moment where, um, you know, what do they do after the play uh, where, you know, they kind of messed up? And then you get to see what they do after that and how they respond and what that critical moment of the game was like. And uh, was it too big for them? You know, and then what was it like the next time they were in that situation? There's so many layers to it. Uh, but I think that uh, the other thing I, I would be upset if I didn't mention is I think quarterback journeys are affected greatly by the environment that they go into. And I don't know if there's going to be a rookie quarterback that goes to a place uh, with what we have to offer here in Minnesota. From Justin and Jordan Addison, TJ Hawkinson, and uh, our players around them to our coaching staff and, and all the things that we've built in our building for the player, by the player, about the player. Um, it's going to be magnified times 10 because the person we bring in this organization um, is going to know that, you know, the, every step of their journey, they're A, not going to be alone, and B, they're going to have world-class coaching and, and teammates and, and uh, fellowship right there with them every single day so that they're never alone because the second loneliest position in an NFL organization to being the head coach, <laughs> the second loneliest position is being that quarterback on Monday morning uh, after a loss, and uh, luckily I'm going to have somebody hopefully to go through it with together. <laughs> Not too much, though. Not too much. Thanks, and my husband said it should shock the world and take Marvin Harrison Jr. Oh, man. <laughs> you okay with a couple? You uh, just let me know if your husband will come by the building and, and help me understand how to distribute all the footballs to Justin, Jordan, TJ, and then Marvin. <laughs> Sir, I might need that football back, actually. <laughs> you okay still? Yeah. You okay? All right. Uh, hey, Coach, thank you for, for being here tonight. I'm a huge fan of you and, of course, the Vikings. You mentioned earlier your biggest football mentor was 
Coach Belichick, of course, who have been some of your faith mentors. Yeah, and I want to and I want to add one more because I think I would have I would have been very disappointed in myself if I didn't mention the legendary Coach Bud Grant tonight. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, you know, um, Coach Grant for the last year up until his passing. So I met him my first day I was ever the coach of the Minnesota Vikings, and I had lunch with him, give or take about three Thursdays, every Thursday, um, almost up until the week that he passed. And um, the mentorship that he, he gave me, and, and, and I, I would not be even a shell of the person, man, coach I am today without getting that year with him. So I wanted to mention that first and foremost. But, but as far as the mentors, faith mentors, um, one of which is flying to Minnesota um, as we speak. He's going to be accepting an award tomorrow night called the Uncommon Award um, that Tony Dungy gives out to a man of faith, a man of uh, work of, in the community and, and on-field accomplishments. This guy named Matthew Slater. Uh, he's the son of Jackie Slater, Hall of, Fame, Hall of Fame left tackle. Matthew Slater and I were roommates in New England as rookies. Um, we've become, you know, we became best friends, very close friends. Um, he was in my wedding. I was in his wedding. He's got four kids. I have four kids. Um, we've, uh, our football careers went a little different. I mean, he's a 10-time All-Pro, and I'm now in my third year as a head coach. Um, <laughs> but uh, every, single, every single time we talk, uh, he always, you know, has kind of those faith check-ins, and um, he was so strong in his faith and so unbelievably outward with his faith, and he essentially, the last five, six years, he played for the Patriots for the last 13, 14 years, but his last three or four years, he was basically the team chaplain as a player. That's almost as remarkable as being a player coach um, with the type of responsibility that that individual has, but Matthew is... Uh, by far one of the strongest Christians I've ever met in my life. And, uh, you know, it's, it's no shock what he's been able to accomplish. But he's getting an incredible award tomorrow night, and I'm going to be there for him when he gets it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hey, Coach. Two things. Is there a book you'd recommend to read? And second of all, with all the talk of the draft of the quarterback, what about the quarterback we have right now, Sam Darnold? How do you think he'll yeah. affect our offense? I'm no, actually excited I to see him play. Um, I'm a big fan. Uh, just I've gotten a chance to know him over the years. So any John Gordon book you can read, um, I feel like there's a little bit of, because he's got an unbelievable story. Very few people realize John Gordon was basically, you know, considering, uh, you, know, you, know, he had, you know, he was an alcoholic or he was struggling and he thought about taking his own life. And then one day he was introduced to somebody that, eventually introduced him to the Lord, and, and he was baptized, and the, just the light came on for him in a way where he just started, he said he sat down and just started writing books on, and, he, and, he, and at the time, it was like, leadership is what came to me, team building, you know, all the things, and, and he's got some unbelievable books, and he's also de like connected it to his faith in a lot of ways as he's become more successful. And then I do read a lot of military-based books. Okay. I, I think the structure of leadership and the, the, the accountability to somebody greater, somebody other than yourself that exists in our military. Um, the, the adage I like to use with our team is, uh, when you look to your left and you look to your right, have you uh, gotten to a place where you feel like you're ready to trust that person to the maximum amount to go play in the National Football League? Not for yourself, but for them. And do you think that they're willing to do it for you? And those are military principles that means so much more in their line of work than it does in ours. Um, but we tend to steal a lot from them for a reason, and rightly so. Um, so there's been a lot of, you know, anything, I, uh, you know, anything Navy SEAL based, anything Army Ranger based, you know, I love hearing about uh, just as bad as things could get, they still overcame. Okay. And, and, and I think that's uh, great lessons for all of us. I'm actually reading a book right now called Relentless by a guy that used to train Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. And I've gotten to this part where basically, you know, when you win a championship, uh, don't celebrate, just go win another one and another one, another one. Don't spend time with your family. I'm like, what is this book? Uh, but it, it has a lot of great messages. But uh, the moral of the story is you got to be willing to sacrifice a whole heck of a lot to achieve, you know, something as hard to achieve as winning a Lombardi trophy. Yeah. 
All right, we're down to our last two. And yep. some of the questions that have been asked have sort of overlapped some of the online questions. So thank you, those of you who sent questions in. But let's go here, and then our final question over here. Sure, Coach. Um, you know, first off, I think you're sort of underselling yourself as an actual quarterback. <laughs> I'm old enough to remember you back at San Diego State. I'm an ex-QB myself, never played in the NFL like you. But so my question is, you know, NFL draft. And when you're comparing Drake May to JJ, and when you can see JJ operating in the Harbaugh system, he's got really good feet. He looks really, you know, <laughs> fine. But then Drake May, the arm talent and the throws and the anticipating windows. How do you sort of compare that and be like, you know what? Even though his feet aren't, you know, exactly how we need them, he could be, say, like a Josh Allen or something. So yeah, so I think, uh, you know, <laughs> so part of, for a couple of years, I've, you know, I've been kind of known as the quarterback killer when it comes to the draft in, in, in Egan because um, the feeling that everybody, that I feel from our fan base is when we get this next guy, he's going to be the guy. And I feel it. I know you guys all feel it. Uh, so I have... You know, had to, you know, in a lot of ways fight off uh, some mistakes from being made, uh, mainly because the evaluation process I go through, um, I think about the things that are fixable, I think about the things that are coachable, and then you think about the things that, um, you know, I, you could coach another 15 years with the player and you might not be able to fix. And, and, and hope and faith are wonderful things. I do like them to not necessarily be strategies. <laughs> um, so I do, I do very much believe in, in certain principles of playing the quarterback position. I believe the footwork in the lower half of any quarterback can be fixed um, with the proper coaching and teaching. Um, and, and, uh, and I think that uh, when you see the good things on tape, you see things that they can do better on tape. Um, you're looking for a lot of different things and to check a lot of boxes. Um, and, and ultimately, when you feel like you find that guy, then you got to hope that 31 other teams are complicit <laughs> in making sure that they be, can become a Minnesota Viking. But we only need one team to be complicit. Right. And like hopefully, we find that team and, and Maybe that person's you can on work our your team. Patriots connection at three. Right? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I may or may not okay. have sent a nice bouquet of flowers to Robert Kraft the other day, but. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but no, you're, you're, uh, you're spot on because all the things that you said are, are the things we're evaluating and we're, we're trying to find, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, go get that player that, that we feel like uh, can help us eventually get over the hump and go, go win one of these things, multiple one of these things. All right, thanks. All right, last question. Hi, I'm Luke. I was wondering if there is a time in your life where you grew with God the most. Oh, great question. Um, I think, uh, you know, the number one answer would be the day I married that lady right over there um, because she's the strongest, you know, person of faith that I do know. Um, it defines everything about who she is and how she is and, wh and why she is the way she is. Um, but I do remember, I do remember a time when I was probably not uh, much older than you and, uh, um, uh, my grandpa, who has not been mentioned tonight but should, um, he went to church every morning. Um, I remember visiting him in Arizona. He lived at the time. And he, uh, he came home from church, and I said, this was during the time where I would kick and scream on Sundays uh, to go to church. And I said, how do you do it? How do you go every single day? And he said, when it's your why, it's just because. And... It kind of just hit me in that moment because this guy is like, you know, you, my Mount Rushmore of individuals, he's definitely on it. And uh, this guy could do no wrong in my mind. So when he said that, I remember thinking, it's time to wake up and, 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 and try to attempt to one day be like that guy right there. So never, ever underestimate your family, your brothers, your sisters, your mom, dad, grandparents, the people that love you the most. When they tell you something, they probably mean it. One more thing. Will you please sign my ball? Oh. <laughs> Get up here, man. Golly. Of course. We saved the best for last tonight, but 
I need a, uh, give me a hug, Thank man. You so give much. me a hug. Yes. Thank you so much. Let me say thanks, everyone. Um, yes. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, delight, delighted to have you with us. Thanks to those of you who have been online. And Coach, thank you for taking time out of a very busy schedule. Yeah, we'll keep you. you in our prayers. And we've got a little gift for you. It's a plaque that says, with thanks to Kevin O'Connell for bringing faith to life. And we hope you'll put it proudly in your office. Thank, thank you very, very much. much.